Our first one is x. x has a domain of xer, right? It's a line. Yes? Our other one is a radical. So we have to say whatever the heck is under the radical has to be greater than, can it be equal to? Can you take a square root of zero? Yes. Greater than or equal to zero. And then I get nine. And I move the x over like this. Now people revolt and they're like, they're a little bit rebellious and they're like, I don't know what to do with that. So you can rewrite it, x and nine. And if it's close to the x, it just has to stay close. So it ends up flipping that inequality sign. Or we could have left it where it was, moved the 9 over, divided by negative x, and we divide by a negative, divide by negative 1, sorry, and we divide by negative the inequality sign. Either way, we end up with that same domain. So the domain of the function, the second function, is x is less than or equal to 9. The domain of the original function, the first one, is xer. So where are they both? Here. So that's why we know that that domain of those two functions combined in multiplication results in that. And that's why you're taught the function uh, unit, where you have to do f times g, f plus g, f minus g, composition, f of g, the fogs and the gogs, and the gogs and the fogs, you know, all the things. So, that's our domain, which is going to help us for our number line for increasing and decreasing, and concavity. Okay, so the first thing we have to get is the critical numbers, correct? So I'm going to rewrite it in a form that I can use. So how do I get the critical numbers? What am I going to have to do? Starts with a P. Product rule. product rule. I thought I was going to have to say rhymes with product rule. So thank you. Product rule. So we're going to do Y prime equals, and then we do G times F prime plus F times G prime. Now what is the derivative of that? I get one half. 9 minus x to the negative a half times negative 1, right? Because of the derivative in the inside. So the negative can join the half. So I'm going to get negative 1 half 9 minus x to the negative a half. Now this is one term. This is another term. And I say, what can I take out of both of those terms? 9 minus x to the negative 1 half, true. What else? Can you go to half? Okay, now what's left over? 9 minus x to the half, take out 9 minus x to the negative a half, is a half minus a minus a half, which is 1. Remember, whenever we do these, they result in a 1. That's the key thing, because when we do the derivative of this, we're subtracting 1 from it. So we're going to get 9 minus x plus x and I take a negative, a half, or I take a half out, I'm left with negative 1, and then that's gone. So the 2 and the 9 minus x to the half can drop to the bottom. We get 2, 9 minus x to the half down here. That's up. Oh, there's a 2 here. 2 here. 2 here. 2 here. So then we're going to get 18 minus 2x. Minus x. So we get minus 3x plus 18 over 2. What can I do to the numerator? Factor out a negative 3, and I'm left with x minus 6, 2, 9 minus x to the half. So the negative 3 and the 2 do nothing. We agree? They do something when we get to the number line, but they don't get its critical number. We take the other two and get our critical numbers from them. So we get x minus 6 equals 0. So x equals 6. And then we get 9 minus x to the half equals 0. How do I get rid of a half? Raise to the power of 2. What is 0 to the 2? Zero. So it doesn't matter what those are, that exponent is just going to end up going away because when you raise zero to the power of that, bye-bye. And so then we get 9 minus x equals zero, so 9 equals x. So our critical numbers of the first derivative Our x equals 9 and 6, 
We're going to do our number line. Our number line is, is it less than or equal to 9? Or greater than or equal to 9? Would you like to lock out? No lock the Yeah, no. You're just late. Not you didn't get locked out? Oh, we got locked out. Okay, that's all. What? All right. So it's less than or equal to 9. So we have 9, closed dot, negative infinity, and then in the middle we have a 6. Then we have to run test points. Do you agree? Okay. So I'm going to use 0 and 7. And I'm going to plug it into my factored form. So I always plug it into the most factored form because it's just a little bit easier to figure out what the sign would be. And I would go negative 3, 0 minus 6 over 2, 9 minus 0 to the half. What is something to the power of a half just the same as? Square root, right? That's why in grade 10 you guys are taught to change radicals to rational exponents. Radicals being the square root function to rational exponents being fraction exponents, and then fraction exponents back to radicals. You're taught that in grade 10 for this very moment in time. Because everything you're taking is called pre-calc, right? For this moment in time. So, we don't need our calculators. We get negative 3, so that's a negative, times 0 minus 6 is a negative, and then 2 is a positive, and then 9 minus 0 is 9, so 9 is positive. So what's a negative times a negative divided by a positive times a positive? Positive. And I'm going to try 7. So I get negative 3. I should write this as f prime of 0. So that, because I was marking it differently. Then f prime of 7. So I get negative 3. And then I get 7 minus 6 over 2 times 9 minus 7 to the half. So I get a negative, 7 minus 6 is a positive, 2 is a positive. And now some people are like, well, 9 minus 7 is 2, square root of 2. I don't know what the answer is. Do I care what the actual answer is? No, I just need to care that it is positive. So I'm going to end up with a negative over a positive, which gets me a negative. So interval of increase. And remember, you could look in your calculator and see if you're right. It should be increasing in your calculator between um, from negative infinity to 6. And interval of decrease. All right. Uh, well, <clears throat> you could put a square back in. All right. <clears throat> the second derivative, what would I have to use? The first derivative to find it, correct? Now, the best one is not always the most simplified. The best one, I would use this one here. So I'm going to go f prime of x equals negative 3x plus 18 over 2 bracket 9 minus x to the half. So f prime is what? Negative 3. g prime is 2. Uh, drop the half in front, so 2 times a half. 9 minus x to the negative a half times negative 1. So it's negative. 9 minus x to the negative half. Right? Then what do we have to do for this one? Starts with a q. Quotient rule. So f double prime of x is going to be g times f prime minus f times g prime all over 
g squared. Okay, let's do a little bit. I'm going to do a little simplifying first before I take out anything. So I'm going to get negative 6, 9 minus x to the half. Then I get minus times a minus. So this minus and this minus gets me a plus sign. And then I have 9 minus x to the negative a half times negative 3x plus 18. All over. Uh, what do we get here? 2 squared is 4. And then I can distribute that through. It's 9 minus x to the 1. Do I actually care? Could I just leave it the way it is? Because I could still get a critical number from it, can't I? I could have just left it as a 2 and then 9 minus x to the half squared. All right. <clears throat> so I can take out of the top a 9 minus x to the negative a half. I don't have to take, I could take a 6 or a 3 out. I don't have to, but I could. So I can take out a 3. I can take out a negative 3. Um, this here, I can write as, I can go to negative 3, and then I would be left with x minus 6. So take a negative 3 out, and then I'm left with 2 times 9 minus x, plus that's gone. The 3 is gone, and I'm left with x minus 6 all over 4 times 9 minus x. And then this can join the bottom. I get negative 3, 18 minus 2x plus x minus 6 over 4. And then this is 1 plus a half, so it's 9 minus x to the 3 half. Like that. And then I can collect my terms. So I get negative 3, 2x minus x is negative x plus 12 over 4, 9 minus x to the 3 half. So what are my critical numbers based off of? The brackets that are left over, correct? <coughs> so this one gives me a critical number of x equals 9. We know that already. It's just an endpoint though, right? And then this one, I'll get negative x plus 12 equals 0. So 12 equals x. So that's where my point of inflection is going to occur, is at 12, right? Your critical numbers of the second derivative are always your point of inflection unless they're an asymptote. So if an asymptote occurs at one of the critical numbers in the second derivative, it's still an asymptote. It's not a point of inflection. So unless you have a domain, like unless your original equation is irrational, your second derivative will always get you your critical numbers. Yeah? All right, so let me go to our number line. And then it has a 12 out here. Can everyone type the original in their calculator? Throw in our test point. We'll throw in zero because zero is the easiest. I'm going to go negative three, negative zero plus twelve. F double prime of zero. And then four, nine minus zero to the three halves. So I'm going to get negative times a positive. Four is a positive. And then this is the square root of nine cubed. Well, that's going to be a positive. So what do I end up getting? Negative. And when we looked at our calculator, it was completely concave down that entire time, wasn't it? So this integral of concavity concave down from negative infinity to 9. Is there a point of inflection? 
No, why? The critical number was what? Outside the domain. So do you see why I tell you the very first step of doing any of these questions is to check your domain? Because just because you get a critical number in the second derivative doesn't mean it exists, right? In that restricted domain. Make sense? Ish? Go ahead. When you have a variable base to a variable exponent, I'm just bringing this up because everyone forgets about it. You have to ln base 10 both sides, or ln e both sides. I went ln base 10 because that is 30 f on there. It's embedded in my soul. Ln both sides. No. And then uh, the reason why you do that is so you can take that e to the x and drop it in front. So we have ln of y equals e to the x. Thanks, board. Uh, times ln of x. And I put the multiplication dot in there so that you can see that there's actually a product rule existing. Yes? Okay, how do you do the derivative of a ln? You take what's beside it, put it in the base, ln the uh, base, which is e, and then the derivative is in the top. So if I have ln of y, y is going to go in the base, what's beside it, then technically ln of e, but do I have to write ln e? No. No. Why am I showing that? Because if it's any other ln, say it's log base 6, you'd have a ln 6 on the bottom, correct? And then on the top is the derivative of that, which is y prime. So then we do g, which is ln of x, ln of x times f prime, which is e to the x, plus f, which is e to the x. And what's the derivative of ln x? 1 over x. Okay, so I have y prime over y equals, what can I take out of these two terms? e to the x. Then I'm left with ln of x plus 1 over x. And then I have to remember to bring my y up. Remember with logarithmic differentiation, that's your very last step, is to bring that y up and then actually fill in what the heck y is, which is x e to the x. So I'm going to get y prime equals, instead of a y, I'm going to put x e to the x. e to the x ln of x plus 1 over x. Done. We agree? What does the other logarithmic, logarithmic differentiation look like? A quotient rule with some product rules in it, right? Like successive looking polynomial-ish. So if I asked you to find a given f of x equals x minus 4 cubed, 2x minus 1 to the half, over 3x plus 2 to the third. And then I say find f prime using logarithmic differentiation. Try it out. Long both sides, that's the hint to logarithmic differentiation, first step. So, I chose these because I know you guys forget that this is part of derivative. So remember how we start these ones again if it's logarithmic differentiation, is you take the ln of both sides. Then we use 30-1 math log laws to separate these. So, we are going to get... The, we're not doing the derivative of anything currently, correct? We're just getting that in a form that we can use. So we have ln of f of x, and then anything with the plus, or on the top with the plus one in front, anything in the bottom gets a minus. So I get ln of x minus 4 cubed plus ln of 2x minus 1 to the half minus ln of 3x plus 2 to the third. 
And then we still haven't done a derivative yet. This is all grade 12 log laws, correct? The product and quotient laws. Then we can use power rule. The three drops in front. The half drops in front. The third drops in front. I still have not done a derivative, not one. So I get 3 ln x minus 4 plus 1 half ln 2x minus 1 minus 1 third ln 3x plus 2. Okay, peanut gallery. All right. Have I done a der derivative yet at all? No, I've only done grade 12 math, 30-1. Okay? So... Now I have it in a form that I actually can differentiate, correct? Or derivatize, as some people might say. Yeah. Sorry, we only got one person. So the derivative of ln f of x, f of x goes in the bottom, the derivative of it in the numerator, because that's what you do with ln. You write what's beside, derivative in the top, and you technically have a ln e in the base, but we don't keep it. Then I have 3 over 1 x minus 4 goes in the numerator, and or the denominator and the derivative of it, which is 1, goes in the numerator. Plus 1 half, 2x minus 1 goes in the denominator, the derivative of 2x minus 1 is 2, numerator. Minus 1 third, 3x plus 2 goes in the denominator, the derivative of 3x plus 2, numerator. So now I have f prime of x equal, over f of x equals... 3 over x minus 4 plus these cancel. 1 over 2x minus 1. These cancel. Minus 1 over 3x plus 2. They don't make you have common denominators. They just let you put in brackets and remember to bring the f of x up by multiplication. So f prime of x, the big old f of x from the top, has to get rewritten in front. So I'm going to get x minus 4 to the 3, 2x minus 1 to the half, over 3x plus 2 to the third. And then square brackets, 3 over x minus 4, plus 1 over 2x minus 1, minus 1 over 3x plus 2. Done. Okay, we covered that. Now we're going to look at some limits. Because at the very um, end of the lesson I just gave you, there's role theorem, mean value theorem, which we're going to touch on tomorrow. But at the very end, it's called L'Hopital's rule. And you can't do, L'Hopital uses limits, but you can't do it until you know how to do a derivative, because it uses derivatives to find the limits of such things. So, Let's go back to a few limits that I gave you in the past. So, say I give you, this is just side notes before we get into L'Hopital. Say I give you the limit as x approaches 3, x minus 3 in the denominator, and then, I don't know where it's going with that, x squared um, minus 4x plus 3. Good. So, when we're doing this question, what is our problem? If I plug in the 3, I'm going to get 0 in my denominator, correct? So, when you get a limit, the first thing you always do, you try and do is direct substitution. But if when you do direct substitution, you get a 0 in your denominator, you can't do direct substitution. So, there might be something else that you have to do to try and get rid of the problem. My problem currently is a lot of things. But for this question, is x minus 3. My biggest problem up today is students who throw out their notes when the course isn't even done yet. <sighs> yeah. After this one. Um, so when you're done, you would have four units worth of notes if you didn't throw them away. It's a crazy thing. Just saying. So my my immediate issue is the notes. But then my second issue when I'm doing the limits question is actually the x minus 3. You see how I have a few problems in my life? That's one of them. Okay. So I would have to factor the top. 
and I would get, quiet please, x minus 3, x minus 1 over x minus 3. These cancel, and then I'm left with the limit as x goes to 3 of 3, or x minus 1, sorry. And the moment I plug it in, what do I, what happens? The limit goes away. So my answer is 2. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean? As it approaches 3, it gets close to 2. So from the left, as I'm approaching 3, and the right, as I'm approaching 3, it's getting closer and closer to 2. Does 2 exist? Does it have to exist in order for a limit to exist? No. no. Does 2 have to exist in order for it to be continuous? Yeah. Yes, because the left and the right and at that value has to be the same. Remember that? Okay. L'Hopital's rule. It's a great thing. L'Hopital's rule is ne um, a necessity when you end up with a 0 over a 0. So when you plug it in, you get 0 over 0. Or you get infinity over infinity. Then you have to use L'Hopital's rule. But let's see if it works on other things. So L'Hopital's rule states that if you actually do the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator separate, not like quotient rule, the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator, and then you can plug in the answer, you should get the same limit. So let's, what the heck does that mean? Well, let's go. We write our question down. We get the limit as x approaches 3. Now, I have the original, which is x squared minus 4x plus 3, and then x minus 3. So I am going to differentiate the numerator. What is the derivative of x squared minus 4x plus 3? 2x minus 4. Cool. What's the derivative of the denominator? 1. Is my problem gone now? Is my problem gone? Yep. yep. So can I fill it in now? Yep. 2 times 3 minus 4 is 6 minus 4, which is 2. Same answer. Now you need to be able to do both. Love tell you have to use when you plug in um, your value and you get 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. The only way you can do it is by lock time. Now, if when I differentiate the numerator and I differentiate the denominator and I plug in, I still get a denominator of 0, I just do it again. I just differentiate the numerator again and the denominator again, and I do that until I don't have to anymore. Okay? So we're going to go to the actual notes I gave you. These ones. And we're going to go here. All right. Bye, please. So we have indeterminate forms and L'Hopital rule. So steps for check, finding a limit using L'Hopital's rule. The second page. So it is, well, it's secondly the third, right? It's the second piece of paper. <laughs> so, number one says, check that f divided by g is an indeterminate form of c of the type 0, 0, or theta, or infinity over infinity. If it is not, do not use L'Hopital's rule. <laughs> okay. Differentiate f and g separately. So the biggest error that happens here is people think they need to do quotient rule. Did I tell you to do quotient rule because it's division? No, you differentiate the top, you differentiate the bottom, poof, fill in. Then here it says, find the limit as x approaches c of the two derivatives. Then they'll give you the same one. Um, if f prime over g prime is an indeterminate form, so when you find the first derivative of both, you plug it back in, you still get 0 over 0, or you get a division of 0, you just do it again. You differentiate the top again, differentiate the bottom again, until you can fill it in where that problem doesn't happen. Okay? So we'll look at the first one. The first one says, find the limit as x approaches 0 of tan x over uh, 6x. Now, if I plug 0 in, if I actually plug the 0 in, so 
So if I found f of 0 here, I would get tan of 0 over 6 times 0. Tan of 0 is sine divided by cos, which is 0 over 1, which is 0. 6 divided by 0 is 0. So can I plug those in? Do you have any crazy knowledge that will get that 6x to cancel off somehow with a tan x? I don't have any. So if you find some, give me some knowledge on it. Uh, so this screams indeterminate forms and L'Hopital rule. So we are going to rewrite the limit. So we're going to rewrite the limit because we always rewrite the question. We don't try and work our work out of the question. So our next step then, after rewriting the question, is doing the derivative of the numerator and then the derivative of the denominator. So what's the derivative of tan x? Secant squared x. And what's the derivative of 6x? 6. So now, am I going to have a 0 in my denominator? No. No, because I have a 6, correct? So now can I plug in? Yes. I get secant squared of 0 over 6. And just so you know, secant squared of 0 is the same as writing secant of 0 squared. That's for everyone's benefit. Secant of 0 is the same as cos of 0 flipped. What's cos at 0? What's the x at 0? 1. What's the 1 flipped? 1. It's crazy. So I'm going to get 1 over 6. And there's my answer. So the, this equals 1 6. Okay? You will need it, yeah. 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 Okay, you try B. First thing we do, rewrite it. Actually, the first thing we do is we plug the 0 in, and we're going to see that we get 0 over 0, which is a problem. Um, then we rewrite the question. Then we do the derivative of the numerator. So what's the derivative of sine x? Cos x. The derivative of negative x? Minus 1 over 2x. Oh crud, I fill 0 in, I'm going to get 1 minus 1 over 0, which is 0 over 0. Ruh -ruh. So what do I do? Repeat, do it again. So I get the limit as x approaches 0. Of what's the derivative of cos x? Negative sine x. What's the derivative of 1? Minus 1. It's gone. And the bottom has a 2. Now is it going to have a problem? No. Now I can plug in. So I get minus sine of 0 over 2. What is sine of 0? What's y at 0? 0. So my answer is 0. Okay, infinity ones we're going to do together. So if I plug these in, I would get infinity over infinity, which is a problem. Because as a lawn approaches um, infinity, it just keeps going like this, like this, like this, and it's just going to go on to infinity forever and ever and ever. Like Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond, you know? It's a lawn. Yeah. So... What we're going to do is differentiate the numerator and the denominator. So we're going to get to rewrite the question. Shh. Quiet. Okay. What is the derivative of ln, which is going to be the top? Ln of x. What's the derivative of that? What's the derivative of ln of x? 1 over x. Yes. There was some whispering. I saw it, and I agree. What's the derivative of x? 1. So right now I have the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x, technically. Now, this is a spot where you would not need a calculator. If your x gets... It gets big. If x gets big, you know? Uh, if it gets big. What's going to happen down here? So if this is a hundred, or a million, or a billion, what's one over that? What's going to happen? You're going to get zero decimal, zero, 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 one. Or zero decimal, zero, 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 z
So what's it getting get closer and closer to? Zero. Zero decimal zero 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 one is zero, not infinity. So it will be zero. Try this one out. All right, we have two left, and then you have um, homework. Okay, so we rewrite it. The limit as x approaches infinity. If I plugged infinity in, quiet please, I would get infinity over infinity because e to a really large number just gets really large, right? If I take a 2 and raise it to the power of a million, it's going to get really big. So e, which is 2.7181 to the power of a million, get even bigger. So it's going to be infinity, infinity. It's going to grow. So that's why I have to use L'Hopital. So I get 1 over e to the x. What happens when I plug a really large number in here? This is just going to get really large faster, correct? It's exponential growth, is it not? So when I have 1 over a really large number, what does that result in? Zero, zero decimal. Zero, 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 zero. Same thing as we just had, right? So this is going to equal 0. Now we're going to flip over. There's an E, and sometimes the computer thinks it's really smart, and it puts an F below it because it thinks I'm moving on, but I'm not. And I forgot to delete the F. Okay, remember when you had trig in grade 12 and you were so excited and everyone loved it? Yeah, it was great. Super fantastic. We have one question with trig. Now, if we look at this one and we go to do the antiderivative of this, or sorry, do the derivative of it, we'd have to do a product rule on the bottom, right? And then we it should be complicated. So what you actually try and do first when it's trig is sometimes you try and actually use formulas to make it in a more simple form. So it kind of looks a little bit like proofs at first, which everyone loves, I know. So our first step is to rewrite it. If we plug in 0, we will get 0 over 0. So it's an indeterminate form. So we know we have to use L'Hopital. OK? L'Hopital, the way it is right now, is a lot of work. So what we're actually going to do first is we're going to try and make this simpler. So what did your teacher suggest for you to do when you got to a proof? What was the very first step? Yeah. What? What did, you, what? What did your teacher tell you to do? <laughs> oh my gosh, when you got to a proof, what was the first thing they told you to do? Restrictions, we do not have to do. No. But I like restrictions. They're great. We don't have to do them right now. So, did your teacher happen to say if you can turn things into sine and coses, do that? They absolutely did. Because the person who just said no is me. I'm the teacher. The person who said, you turn things into sine and coses if you can. Because then you make common denominators and stuff. Oh my gosh. I know, I know, I saw your notes. I know they had it. I taught you, so I know you had it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so tan can turn into what over what? Sine x over cosine. Minus sine x over 1. Then the denominator will be x squared over 1, and tan can turn into what? Sine x. Sine x over cos x. Now, I know your teachers taught you this as well. What would you do in the top? Because the only way you can actually, ooh, the only way you can cancel off stuff is if you have a full fraction divided by a full fraction. Like this partial stuff that's going on at the top, I can't cross the cos off of the cos because this one doesn't have a cos. So what your teacher taught you is you need to make a common denominator and get those together. So we're going to times this one by cos x. Exactly. So we're going to get the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x minus sine x cos x over cos x. All over x squared sine x over cos x. 
Now, do I have a full fraction over a full fraction? Technically? Yes? So, can your denominators cancel off if they're the same? Yes, because what will we end up doing? We would take this. If you want, we can, I can show you the middle step. The reason why these can cancel is because what we can show if we want to is we can go sine x minus sine x cos x over cos x. This is this black line's division, so we can multiply by the flip, cos x over x squared sine x. And then the cos x is just cancel off, right? So that's why when you have denominators that are the same, in a full fraction, full fraction, they can cancel because of the invert and multiply step. So now we are actually left with sine x minus sine x cos x over x squared sine x. Now, I'm going to see if my students remember this. If there is a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out my hook with my DJ. Ice, ice, baby, too cold. You're too young to know that. You just, you just Google it. You, you are. Because that was like when I was little. And I, I'm not little anymore. Okay. If you have a problem, shh. See, now it's stuck in your heads. Uh, you know, but it, actually, if you have a problem and you're stuck, what did I tell you most of the time it is? GCF, someone said it. Who said it? Ah, see, he even had it drilled into his memory. GCF, can we take anything out of the top? Then we're left with sine x divided by sine x, which is 1, minus cos x, over x squared sine x. Then what can we do? And now I'm in a much better form to quickly do L'Hopital 2. Oops, I'm already trying to do L'Hopital 2. Oh, wait. So we rewrite the limit as x goes to 0. I'm so glad when we do a little bit of trade because this is how everyone does this sheer panic in polls and no one can stop that. How was the third one as well? So on. Okay. What's the derivative of one minus cos? Because we're doing a lot to tell now. Derivative of one. You got it. Negative. I'm just gonna wait you guys out because you guys give me two answers. One of them is right. One of them is wrong. It's just sine x because it'd be negative. The derivative of cos x is negative sine. Negative and negative is positive. Oh, crud. I'm still in trouble. What do I have to do? What's the derivative of sine? What's the derivative of 2x? Okay, guys. Stop talking. Now we plug it in and we get cos of 0 over 2. What's cos of 0? 1. Yay! <laughs> Page 307, 7 to 25 odd in the